And do you know Mr. and Mrs. Astor? Good evening, madam. Oh, and a touch of glamour at your table. You'll have heard of Miss Dorothy Gibson. Oh, I doubt it. Why should folks like you care about my crazy job? <laughs> and this is my mother. Hello. Miss Gibson, the film star. And Imagine hearing the cries and screams of horror from people who you know will surely sink to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean as you sit safely in a lifeboat. Now imagine being in that lifeboat with death all around you and having one concern on your mind, and it is. I'll never be able to wear all of my new clothes from Paris. They sank with the Titanic. If you were Dorothy Gibson, you wouldn't have to imagine it. That's one of the many selfish thoughts that went through her head and even came out of her mouth as 1,500 people were in the midst of losing their lives while she made her way safely onto a lifeboat that was never even loaded to full capacity. In our modern times, many of us can't help but to think of James Cameron's Titanic film when we think of the actual 1912 sinking. Its big names and big budget special effects and set certainly made it a spectacle for the eye to remember. Yet, Titanic historians and survivors when they were alive preferred the 1958 film called A Night to Remember for its historical authenticity. It is often called the first Titanic movie, but it's not. The first Titanic movie was called Saved from the Titanic, and it was released in May of 1912, just four weeks after the disaster occurred. And its star was our Dorothy Gibson, the girl who was so sad about losing her brand new Parisian fashions in the wee morning hours of April 15, 1912. She was a silent film actress, and this role was going to make her a bigger star than she already was. And the movie was made by her lover, a man who was married to another woman. But you know how the saying goes, whatever is done in the dark will come to the light. And the way that this adulterous affair came to be known by the public was a scandal in and of itself. Dorothy's story has it all. Sexual affairs, crazy court cases, a man in a nightgown, a homicide, and a stay in a Nazi concentration camp. This is the story of one of the most self-absorbed first-class passengers who boarded the Titanic, silent film actress Dorothy Gibson. She was a total hot mess. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload content. And please hit that thumbs up to support this video for free. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. Dorothy Gibson was born Dorothy Winifred Brown on May 17, 1889 in Hoboken, New Jersey. Her father was John A. Brown. He died when she was only three years old. Her mother was Pauline Caroline Boson, and she remained in Dorothy's life until she died. Until Dorothy died, that is. Dorothy's mother, Pauline, ended up outliving Dorothy. Her mother didn't waste any time when it came to marrying again. Pauline was always looking for a way to climb up, so any old man just wouldn't do. When she caught the attention of an affluent merchant named John Leonard Gibson, she knew that he was the one. She married him before Dorothy turned five, and it was through this marriage that Dorothy received the surname Gibson, the name that she would use in her stage and film career that made her a household name in America, Dorothy Gibson. John Gibson, though he had a large amount of money, was a sensible man and didn't feel the need to spend a lot or show off what he had. Pauline was the opposite, and she reared Dorothy to be the same as she. Frivolous when it came to spending money and having an appetite for the finer things in life. This created a divided household, John standing alone against mother and daughter. 
Pauline was rearing Dorothy to be a bit of a spoiled brat. Here's how Dorothy described their relationship dynamic after she became famous. Quote, My father is a great man of the spirit and is contented with the simple life. But I and my mother are bohemian, and we find the pleasures of this lovely world irresistible. End quote. So let's talk about her path to fame. In 1906, the Gibson family moved from New Jersey to Manhattan, where Dorothy was introduced to the theater, and she became obsessed. She wanted to be on stage, too. And what Dorothy wanted, Pauline saw to it that Dorothy got. By the time Dorothy was 17, her mother had her on stage, dancing, acting, and singing in vaudeville productions. It is impossible to tell Dorothy's story without frequently mentioning her mother, Pauline. Pauline was a stage mother of the worst kind. As a very young girl, men took notice of Dorothy's good looks, and her mother didn't mind pimping out her daughter if it was to her own advantage. So Pauline managed Dorothy's career. Under Pauline's management, Dorothy became a regular chorus girl at the Hippodrome Theater. And Dorothy also made it to Broadway to perform in a musical called The Dairy Maids. That was considered to be a pivotal moment in her career. After the musical, she started getting noticed for bigger opportunities. In 1909, a famous commercial artist wanted to work with Dorothy. His name was Harrison Fisher. And I want to give you a little background information on him. Chances are that if you're interested in this side of history, you're already familiar with Charles Dana Gibson. He was a commercial artist who got his start in the 1880s. He became famous for drawing The Gibson Girl, an iconic illustration that was said to have portrayed American beauty at its best. His Gibson Girl images were everywhere, and Charles Gibson worked for decades in his field. As Gibson's fame was dying out, Harrison Fisher was just getting started, and he had a new ideal in mind for the American beauty standard, and it was Dorothy Gibson. After seeing her perform at the Hippodrome Theater, he went backstage to meet her and asked her if she would sit as a model for him. She was beyond flattered at the notion, so of course she accepted. And their collaboration made her more famous than she had ever dreamed she could be. Charles Dana's Gibson Girl was a thing of the past. The new thing now was the Harrison Fisher Girl. And that's what they called Dorothy, the original Harrison Fisher girl. And I think that it's such a quirky coincidence that the Gibson girl was replaced by a girl whose name actually was Gibson, but she became known as the Fisher girl. Now, because of Fisher, Dorothy Gibson was booking modeling gigs. She would sit for his drawing sessions and he used her face on product labels in book illustrations, on postcards, and she was even on the cover of women's magazines like Ladies Home Journal and Cosmopolitan. Her face was everywhere and she was legitimately famous. And she didn't understand why. Dorothy knew that she was pretty, but she had seen Fisher's other models and thought that they were prettier than she. Here's how she described her confusion about becoming his most famous model. Quote, I was fortunate to be discovered, in a manner of speaking, by Mr. Fisher, but he had many models, and some of them were far prettier than I was. I do not know what he saw in me. End quote. Well, I think that's just the thing. Fisher wasn't exactly drawing Dorothy. Here's what I mean. Dorothy was his palette or starting template. But he wouldn't draw her exactly as he saw her or exactly the way she looked. This sounds creepy to me, but he would draw Dorothy in a way that made her look both younger and more sexualized at the same time. Like if he were around today, authorities might be interested in seeing just what he was looking at online, if you catch my drift. To accomplish the sultry and childlike look he was going for, he would soften the shape of her nose, extend the space between her eyes, and slightly lift her jaw. 
The June 1911 edition of Cosmopolitan displays this style and is analyzed by Andrew Wilson in Shadow of the Titanic, who points out that Dorothy is drawn, quote, drinking sarsaparilla from a tall glass, her long fingers caressing its base, the lips of her rosebud mouth closed around the straw. Dorothy's mix of ingenue innocence and barely concealed sexual energy was a winning combination for the illustrator, end quote. By the way, while Dorothy's star was rising as a model, she got married to George Henry Battier Jr., a young pharmacist who was near her age. He exists as a mere footnote in the story of her life, and their marriage didn't last long. We'll get there. After making her mark on the stage and in the world of commercial modeling, Dorothy looked on to the next adventure, and it was film. The movie industry was still in its very early stages in the 1910s, and in 1911, Dorothy entered the industry as an extra, getting in on the ground floor. Before the year was over, she had been hired as a leading lady for the U.S. branch of Eclair Studios, a Paris-based movie studio. Their American operations were in New Jersey. And in that same year, Eclair debuted its first film. It was an historical drama called Hands Across the Sea. Dorothy played the role of Molly Pitcher, and the debut was a success. But later that year, the studio would find Dorothy's real strength, and it wasn't in playing a serious, dramatic character. Dorothy shined in comedy. Miss Masquerader was Dorothy's next role, and it was a hit for her and the studio. She received positive reviews for her acting, with critics writing that she had a natural talent for pulling off comedy in film. Dorothy's fame had certainly reached new heights after her Miss Masquerader film was released, but after surviving the Titanic disaster, her most famous role ever would come about as a direct result of having traveled on the doomed liner. The film was called Saved from the Titanic, and it was based on her own experience, loosely, very loosely. So how did Dorothy Gibson even wind up on the Titanic in the first place? It was actually she and her mother. They had been enjoying a European vacation that was supposed to have lasted for three months. It got cut short when Dorothy received a call from her studio telling her that she needed to return home to start filming a new series of movies. When she learned that the Titanic was the first ship headed back home, she booked first-class tickets for her mother and herself to get on it. Pretty straightforward. But why was she in Europe? Yeah, sure, she was on vacation, and everybody needs a break from time to time. But there was another reason that Dorothy had taken this vacation and it wasn't innocent at all. Jules Brulatour was a producer at Eclair Studios and one of the most powerful men in the budding film industry. He was Dorothy's boss, and he provided the financial backing for a number of her films. He was also Dorothy's lover. The main problem with this was that he was a married man, and he didn't mind hiding money from his wife and using it to shower Dorothy with expensive presents. He was interested in Dorothy from the moment he met her at a film industry gala in 1911. He told her that night that he felt like he already knew her because he had seen her lovely photos in all of the newspapers. Dorothy's mother, Pauline, loved the attention and the money and the material things that Dorothy and she got as a result of this illicit affair so she pushed for it to continue. Pauline didn't want to miss out on anything that she could get from her daughter opening her legs to this married man. But you know how these things usually go. The married man enters the affair wanting sex. The woman enters wanting marriage. That was the case with this affair. Dorothy wanted marriage, and so did her mother. Pauline's thought was, if he's doing all this for you as a mistress, just think of what we can get if he marries you. Mind you, at this time, Dorothy was earning $175 per week. Adjusted for inflation, that's a little over $12,000 per week in today's 2024 money. 
so Dorothy was not hurting financially in any way. But enough was a word that wasn't in her mother's vocabulary. Pauline knew that Dorothy could get a lot more money if she could marry Jules and have access to his fortune. For months, she had already been arranging the meetings for Dorothy to have sex with Jules. During the daytime, they were at the studio. He was Mr. Brulatour, and she was Dorothy. But at nighttime, they were at the St. Regis Hotel, and he was her Julie, and she was his Mutsi. Lovey Debbie nicknames. How stupid. So Pauline just came up with one more scheme to get this pair of lovers together forever. In a nutshell, the plan was to make Jules miss Dorothy so much that he would realize that he wanted to marry her. Pauline told Dorothy to ask for some time off so that she could take a vacation to Europe. She was given the time off. Then Dorothy and Pauline made their way to Europe. They had a three-month itinerary that included several stops in European countries and North Africa. They set sail on March 17, 1912. The whole time they were gone, Pauline was coaching Dorothy on what to say in telegram messages to Jules that were sent to his office at the studio. Tell him that you bought a sexy dress in Monaco and you can't wait for him to see you in it. Tell him you bought some naughty lingerie in Paris and you can't wait to wear it for him. Tell him all the things that you want to do for him in the bedroom. We're all adults here. We know that she wasn't talking about folding his laundry in the bedroom. It all sounds so straightforward. Too straightforward and way too aggressive for a woman, especially in that era. But guess what? It worked. Dorothy's absence coupled with her sexy messages, had her on Jules' mind day and night, and he was ready to leave his wife to marry Dorothy. On April 8th, Dorothy received a telegram at her hotel in Genoa. It was from her studio, telling her that she needed to return home ASAP. Not because Jules was ready to marry her. That would come later. This telegram was about business. It was time to film a new series of silent films, and they needed her at work. So it was settled, and Dorothy and Pauline would be on their way back to America only three weeks into their three-month trip. Dorothy made a quick stop in France, and she was able to book a ticket on some ship called the Titanic. That's all that she knew about it. It was her quickest way to get home. Dorothy had no idea that two days after getting that telegram, that she and her mother would soon be aboard the largest and most luxurious vessel that had ever sailed. On April 10th, they were on the Titanic, and just like every other passenger on that liner, Dorothy and Pauline were having a grand old time until trouble struck on April 14th at 11.40 p.m. Thankfully, because Dorothy was so famous, and a lot of people wanted to hear what she had to say about her time on Titanic, we have a lot of information about what happened to her. So let me tell you about Dorothy's last night on the Ship of Dreams. Dorothy and Pauline were in the saloon on Deck A, playing bridge with a couple of friends they'd made from first class. Two men, Frederick Seward, a marine lawyer, and William Sloper, a stockbroker. As Dorothy remembered it, there was, quote, a great deal of merriment on board, end quote. Then they felt something, a slight jar, as she put it. But of course, they didn't stop the game. There was nothing to worry about. They were on an unsinkable ship. Well, every ship is unsinkable until it sinks. And before Dorothy's card game was over, it became clear the Titanic was going down. According to Dorothy, after feeling that movement, she and the other bridge players carried on playing and laughing for another 15 minutes before she realized that something was amiss. When she looked up from her card hand, she finally noticed the ship's stewards and officers. As she retold the story, they were moving with considerable nervousness. But then... Still nothing was registering that serious danger was just minutes away. 
Dorothy said goodnight to her table and went outside for a walk on the deck. And that's when she saw that Titanic was listing. As she put it, the great ship was leaning heavily on one side. Then she noticed that other passengers didn't notice. She stepped back into the saloon to find everyone having a blast, enjoying that beautiful night, playing cards, talking, laughing, and drinking. Then finally, the group of card players learned that what they felt earlier was the ship colliding with an iceberg. And now it was time to get to safety. And they all did so with relative ease, including the men in her party. At 12.45 a.m., an hour and five minutes after the collision, the first distress signal rocket was fired. Anyone who hadn't got the message likely understood by this point. The time for fun and games was over. Officers on the starboard side of the ship were ready to launch the first lifeboat. Now, there was a commotion and panic filled the air. Dorothy and Pauline weren't even in control of the directions their bodies were going as a crowd surge came about and people were just leaning into each other, trying their best to get off the boat that just days before, almost everybody in the world wanted to get on. Somehow, Dorothy and her mother managed to hold on to each other and not get disconnected. And Dorothy didn't mind being pushed around the way that she was because she could see that she was being pushed in the direction of where the lifeboats were to be lowered. Frederick and William helped Dorothy and Pauline into a lifeboat. Then, as gentlemen would have been expected to do, they turned away to make a path for more women and potentially children to enter the lifeboat. Well, Dorothy grabbed William's hand and refused to let go. She insisted to the officer in charge that he allow her two male friends to get into the lifeboat. The one thing that there wasn't time for was an argument. So the officer let the two men get in with Dorothy so that he could get about the business of trying to save some more lives. They were joined by the bishops, a couple from Detroit who were on their honeymoon. Yes, most of us are familiar with the phrase women and children first in reference to the loading of the lifeboats in this tragedy, but that's what it was. Women and children first, not women and children only. Dorothy and her fellow passengers were in lifeboat number seven, the first lifeboat that was launched. It was lowered into the water and made its escape from the calamity. I won't say that it was the first lifeboat that was filled because it wasn't full. It sailed away from the Titanic with only 28 people in it, 25 first-class passengers and three Titanic crew members. Now brace yourself. The lifeboat had a capacity to hold 65. Here's a quick side note that I thought you might like. This lifeboat, number seven, almost carried two pregnant teen wives. The lady in the honeymooning couple from Michigan was 19 years old and had conceived on her honeymoon. John Jacob Astor, the richest man on the Titanic, tried to get his 18-year-old pregnant wife in this lifeboat too. Madeline asked her, but she was too afraid to try to get in and decided to stay on Titanic with her husband until much later. And since I've given you one side note, allow me to give you another one. Guess who helped Dorothy and her mother and dozens of passengers into the lifeboats on the starboard side of Titanic? He is the man who walked away from this catastrophe with the reputation for being the biggest coward on board. Bruce Ismay. In real life, and in James Cameron's Titanic, he is the man who was depicted as sneaking into a lifeboat, then lowering his head in shame as his lifeboat was lowered into the water. But back to Dorothy and lifeboat number seven. Knowing that the ocean liner only had enough lifeboats for roughly a third of its passengers to begin with makes this number of 28 passengers in lifeboat number seven seem all the more disgusting. Everyone in number seven was rescued, but not without a hiccup or two. 
A problem arose while the 28 were getting loaded in. The drainage plug in the bottom of the boat somehow got displaced. As Dorothy recalled, women aboard offered up their lingerie items and men offered up some of their clothing items to stuff in the hole. Obviously, these various pieces of cloth didn't provide a tight seal, so icy water started seeping into the bottom of the boat, but just a tiny bit at a time. Still, it was enough to completely cover their feet for the next few hours. As someone who absolutely hates being in cold temperatures, I can only imagine how dreadful those few hours were for them, but I'm sure that they were able to look just as far as their eyes could see and realize that they were still in an enviable position. Yes, their feet were cold, bone-chillingly cold, but hundreds of people around them were freezing to death and drowning. As Dorothy put it, quote, I never knew one could be so cold and live. I ached from head to foot, and I was much more warmly clad than some of the women, end quote. Dorothy was wearing an evening dress that night. She had a sweater and a short overcoat on top of her dress. And when she said that she had on more clothes than other women, that wasn't a judgment call suggesting that the other women were dressed inappropriately. No, many of the other women were dressed for bed on a ship that wasn't supposed to sink. Many of these women were in bed for the night before the ship hit the iceberg. And even when they stepped out of their cabins to learn about the commotion that was going on around them, a lot of them just went back to their beds for the night, thinking, oh, the crew will fix it. So by the time it became clear to everyone that there was a serious emergency underway, it was too late for those women to put on warm clothes. They had one job only, and it was to get off of the Titanic alive. Right around two o'clock in the morning, it finally became obvious to lifeboat number seven passengers that most of Titanic's passengers were not going to escape from the ship. George Hogg, one of the crew members on number seven, ordered that their lifeboat be rowed away from Titanic because the risk of being sucked down with it was high. So those three crew members and passengers did as he said and rowed away from Titanic as hard and quickly as they could. Dorothy's eyes were focused on Titanic, which at this point was partially underwater with its stern up in the air before its final plunge. This is what Dorothy said happened next. Quote, Suddenly, there was a wild coming together of voices from the ship, and we noticed an unusual commotion among the people about the railing. Then, the awful thing happened, the thing that will remain in my memory, until the day I die, end quote. Dorothy was able to get in the first lifeboat that launched. That means that she had a shorter time to panic about getting to safety than most of the people on the ship. And of course, we know that many who were panicking never made it to safety. But even in that short time that Dorothy had to wait for her half-empty lifeboat to drift her out of harm's way, she still found time to think one selfish thought. As her fellow passengers were scrambling on the decks, looking for loved ones, looking for life jackets, trying to find their way into lifeboats, Dorothy's thought was this, and she said it. I'll never get to ride in that gray car again. Now, when I first read this, I thought that perhaps Dorothy was disoriented and having some type of mental breakdown. But no, she knew exactly what she was saying. She was talking about the gray Detroit automobile made by Chalmers that her boyfriend had bought for her. It was a fancy car that she loved to drive. And as the Titanic was starting to sink, that's where Dorothy's mind went. Woe well, is me, I'll never get to drive my favorite car again. But we know that she would get to drive her favorite car again. Dorothy and her fellow passengers in lifeboat number seven spent a long, dark, cold morning in the Atlantic before they were rescued. There was talk amongst them about how horrifying the screams were of the people who had not been so fortunate to find their way into lifeboats. That led to another conversation that was quickly shut down. 
Hey, our lifeboat isn't full. Let's go back and get some more passengers. That was the sentiment of one of the crew members. Well, he was outnumbered. 27 to 1. We can't go back. What if our boat gets pulled under? What if too many people try to get on our boat? They'll all be fine. They can get on their own lifeboats. The crew member then informed the 25 passengers that he knew for a fact that there weren't enough lifeboats for every passenger who had booked the ticket, and some of them would surely sink with the ship or freeze in the ocean. That didn't change anyone's mind. They sat there in lifeboat number seven and listened to the screams and cries until they stopped. The survivors on lifeboat number seven were slightly inconvenienced when some of the icy water started to enter their little craft, but they managed. The coldness in the air was nearly unbearable, especially for the women who had just hours before been perfectly comfortable in their dresses and nightgowns. At some point after most of the passengers who were floating in the water were surely dead, another dreadful thought entered Dorothy's mind. All of those beautiful pieces that she'd bought in Europe for her lover to see. The clothes that were going to make Jules leave his wife for her. They were at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh no, my beautiful new dresses and lingerie. I'm not joking. These are words that she shared about her Titanic experience. The passengers on lifeboat number seven then listened as hundreds of people were submerged into their icy grave. Dorothy said that it was a mixture of yells, shrieks, and moans. And then under the water, they could hear and feel explosions. These were most likely from the stern imploding as it sank. It had to have been horrifying for everyone. But after all of the talk about all of the cries and moans of the people who weren't able to get into a lifeboat, one could only wonder how sorry Dorothy and the other 27 people in lifeboat number 7 truly were. Did they feel badly enough to do something? To help? Well, listen to this. The crew member who told them to row away from Titanic so that they wouldn't go under with her was the lookout, George Hogg. And after the unsinkable sank, he was the one who wanted to turn lifeboat number seven around, have the passengers row back to the spot of the sinking to pick up some more survivors. He knew, as anyone should have known, that they wouldn't last long in the icy waters. But when he told the passengers of lifeboat number seven his suggestion to go back and pick up people who were surely freezing to death, every single person and number seven objected. Dorothy included. Now you tell me, how badly did she really feel? How badly did they really feel? I'm sorry, but there is just no good excuse for this. Every lifeboat should have been filled to capacity. When Dorothy was asked why her lifeboat didn't turn around to pick up passengers, she couldn't quite find the words to explain that to the press. I bet she couldn't. Less than a week after the tragedy, Dorothy's account was published and it was full of contradictions. First, she said that after Titanic disappeared, she could see bobbing heads all around in the water. Then later, she says in that same time frame that no one could be seen in the water. Even if a bit of sense could have been made out of her timeline, it displayed a window of opportunity to save some more lives. I am telling you, she knew what she and her first class ticket holding cohorts had done was wrong and unjustifiable. And I want to make it very clear that Dorothy was not the only one or even the main one to blame. She just so happens to be our subject today. So my focus is on her. I'm looking forward to telling you the stories of everyone in lifeboat number seven and as many Titanic passengers as I can, if you'll allow me to. But it's Dorothy's turn today. These post-Titanic interviews in which she told half-truths, lies, and contradictions lay the groundwork for the script that she would write for her Titanic movie, 
If she had told the American public the truth about how she and her fellow survivors conducted themselves, she would surely lose her status as America's sweetheart. Lifeboat number seven, having only 28 passengers in it, isn't even half of the story. Oh no, this is like an awful infomercial because wait, there's more. Herbert Pittman was the Titanic crew member in charge of lifeboat number five. While drifting in the early morning, he saw Dorothy's lifeboat and called out to its passengers. When he got close enough to see that lifeboat number seven only had 28 passengers, he felt like his own lifeboat was crowded. It held 40. All of the lifeboats were designed to hold 65. When Pittman got close enough, he put some of the survivors from his lifeboat onto Dorothy's. Then crew members tied both of the lifeboats together. Why? So that they could go back together and scoop up as many survivors as possible? Hell no, don't be silly. They tied their two boats together so that they would be more visible to their rescue vessel. Combined, they had enough space to save 62 more people from freezing to death. But instead, they only looked out for the ones who were already safe. This time, no one even suggested going to rescue more people. And this was about the time that Dorothy started to feel sad. For herself. Here's how Titanic researcher Andrew Wilson wrote about it. Quote, In that freezing, uncomfortable boat, she began to feel sorry for herself. She remembered some of the clothes she had bought in Paris just before she had traveled to Cherbourg, garments she had chosen to captivate and titillate her older lover. There was the beautiful afternoon dress, the color of champagne, the pink blouse, a vision of lace and chiffon. And then there were those silk stockings and risque lingerie sets she had packed away in her trunks, all of which now lay at the bottom of the ocean. End quote. Then she thought of Jules, of course, and how much she loved that married man. There were their messages back and forth to each other. We'll do everything, make you completely happy. Love you madly, Julie. Remember, we're talking about telegrams here, so all of the words weren't always included. Another one of his telegrams. It caused no happiness without Mutsi. Never allow you leave again, Julie. To which she replied, Hardly wait, get back. Cable made me awfully happy. Mutsy. Yeah, sure, she'd be happy to get back to see him. But it just wouldn't be the same without her brand new clothes. But oh yeah, people were dead and still dying. Dorothy actually had a discussion on the lifeboat with her friend from the bridge game, William about all of the people who had died. But Dorothy, refusing to look guilty about it, in front of a man who was right there with her and just as guilty as she, continued to say whatever she could to help them all feel better about looking at themselves in the mirror. She told William that hardly any people would be dead because surely most of the passengers got away in lifeboats. We all know that that wasn't true. Chances are, Dorothy also knew that was a lie when she said it. But one of the Titanic crew members quickly put that lie to rest when he interjected and said, Even if all of the lifeboats were filled, not more than a third on Titanic could have escaped. That reality brought lifeboats number five and number seven to silence. There was coldness, death, and stillness in the atmosphere for the next few hours. Then roughly at 6 a.m., the RMS Carpathia arrived to rescue those who had survived through the wee hours of the morning. Lifeboat number seven was the third to have its passengers loaded onto Carpathia. Dorothy met a kind couple who offered her space in their cabin, which she gladly accepted. After eating breakfast, she retired to their room and slept for 26 hours straight. After waking up, the first thing on her mind was her man, not her husband. She was still married to, what's his name, but I'm talking about Jules. 
She wanted to send him a telegram, but she had a long wait. You can imagine how many people were trying to get messages home. Well, on April 17th, she got a telegram from him that read, We'll be worried to death till I hear from you. What awful agony, Julie. Having nothing except the clothes on her back, she had to borrow money to send him a short reply. In case you didn't know, people were charged per each letter or character when they sent telegrams. So she kept her reply short and sweet and professional, since it was going to his home where his wife could easily intercept it. It simply read, Safe, picked up by Carpathia. Don't worry, Dorothy. Then finally, the next day, actually the next night on April 18th, the Carpathia arrived in New York, delayed due to bad weather. It was 9.25 p.m. and very dark outside, but that did not stop the Titanic Welcome Committee from waiting to see their loved ones get off of their rescue vessel. And Jules Brulatour, being the shrewd businessman he was, didn't miss out on an opportunity to capitalize even on this moment. He made sure to have his movie camera rolling for the triumphant return of his mistress. Within the next few days, he had the reel spinning in theaters across the country, and he was making a lot of money because of it. This let him know that he was on to something when it came to the other idea that had been in the back of his mind since he heard about the Titanic going down. A movie about the Titanic disaster, starring his mistress. That was just what the people would want to see. There is this perception that people who lived during the Edwardian period or the Gilded Age, whatever you call it on your side of the globe, lived a much more wholesome way than we do today. And I'm here to tell you that that is simply not true. They just didn't have reality TV and Jerry Springer back then. No spaces existed where they could flaunt the worst of their behaviors. But despite their classy suits and elegant dresses, they too lived scandalous lives. And the general public back then had an appetite for scandal, just as we do today. And Jules knew that he could make another small fortune by filling their movie screens with a bit of human exploitation. He would run the idea by Dorothy as soon as he got a chance to have a quiet moment with her. When Dorothy and Pauline disembarked, there were a lot of loved ones and press members waiting to see them. Dorothy was interviewed by several reporters. She told one, quote, The concerted cry of despair that came from the direction of the liner as she plunged into the ocean is ringing in my ear this minute. I cannot describe it. It sounded like a mighty wail. End quote. Waiting for Dorothy and Pauline were Dorothy's stepfather, her aunt, who was her mother's sister, and even some friends from their neighborhood in New Jersey. Leonard Gibson, Pauline's husband and Dorothy's stepfather, greeted the ladies with a big hug then whisked the entire party off to a celebratory dinner that lasted until early the next morning. The whole time she was thinking about Jules. She wanted to get away from her family and friends so that she could see her lover. And she did. She took a taxi to her apartment. I don't know how she got inside. I suspect that she didn't have her keys. At any rate, she tidied herself up and then went to a hotel to meet Jules. And she was finally in her gray car that she had been daydreaming about on the Titanic. Again, I don't know how she had the key. Maybe the car key was already in her apartment. Car keys were just becoming a thing in 1910, and I have a feeling that this would have been a newer car, but who knows, maybe it didn't need a key. Please forgive the tangent, but my mind really did wonder about how she was able to get back into her apartment and car after midnight. Well, Jules was excited to see Dorothy. And guess what? He had a proposal waiting for her that night. A new film project proposal. Dorothy, you should have seen how crazy things were here. We had Titanic fever in America. Everybody would want to see your survival story. 
It would make you crazy famous. What do you say, Mutsy? She said yes. I tell you, that Jules wasn't one of the leading men in his industry for no reason. But he had another proposal for Dorothy that night. This one came with a $1,000 diamond cluster ring. Will you marry me? Even though I'm still married with three children and not even close to getting a legal separation? She said yes. Sure, a lot of people were sad because they'd lost loved ones who they'd never see again, but Titanic was a win-win situation for Dorothy. Getting on that boat won her the movie role of a lifetime and the man of her dreams. Her thoughts? You know, it really does suck for you all, but everything is going my way, so you should all just be happy about that and come see my new movie. <sighs> you know that this isn't going to end well for her, right? The conversation that Dorothy had with William before they were rescued by Carpathia brings us back to her post-Titanic interviews. Dorothy told the press that she behaved as a lady should have. She was offered a seat on a lifeboat and she took it. End of story, period. Well, William Sloper, her bridge-playing friend, said, but comma, that was not the end of the story. He liked Dorothy, and to some degree could say that she saved his life. But he told the media what Dorothy said on Titanic as people started shuffling around to get on lifeboats. He said Dorothy, quote, kept repeating over and over so that people standing near us could hear her, I'll never ride in my little gray car again, end quote. William let the people know that America's sweetheart was obsessed with her material items while people were trying to save their lives. Why did he feel the need to share this? It may have been because his name was getting dragged in the mud over an embarrassing lie, and he didn't want to go down alone, so he decided to take down his card-playing friend with him. You might want to know what was said about William. Well, I found this article from the April 19th Buffalo Courier, from just days after the disaster. It says that William Sloper was rescued from Titanic because he was mistaken for a woman, because he was wearing a woman's nightgown. Now, this was not true at all, but I can imagine that William was pretty upset about it. The thought is that this story was printed about William because he didn't want to talk to reporters after the sinking. He wouldn't give anyone an interview, so they just started making up stuff about him. Well, their plan worked. It got him to talk. Then eventually, he cleared his name and left a stain on Dorothy's that no one denied. But Dorothy didn't have time to worry about her lies being exposed in newspapers. She had a movie to make. The movies that Dorothy was originally returning to film got put on the back burner. She and Jules got straight to work on this Titanic project. Saved from the Titanic. Very clever name, I know. Dorothy came up with the storyline. Jules secured the filming location and even came up with the bright idea to have her wear the same clothing she had worn that night and early morning on the ill-fated ship. You know... For authenticity. Dorothy was so excited to work on this production. We can't know for certain what was truly motivating her. Was it that she trusted Jules when he said that this movie was going to make her more famous than she already was? Or was it something less self-serving? Was this movie a vehicle for her to deal with her trauma? Was she just excited about the big payday that she knew was coming? Maybe it was a little bit of all of that. The story that she wrote for herself allowed her to be a better version of Dorothy than the real Dorothy. In her movie, her character's name was Dorothy. Dorothy was coming back home on the Titanic to reunite with her boyfriend, Jack. Jack was in the Navy, and he wasn't married. And in her movie version, the part about how Dorothy and the other passengers in Lifeboat Number 7 colluded to not rescue Titanic passengers who were freezing to death, was left out of the script completely. That might have been bad for the real 
Dorothy's image. Dorothy and Jules made the first exploitation film. It was released on May 16, 1912, just one month after the sinking, and it performed very well in box offices in the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. Dorothy was on top of the world and everything was going her way, against all odds. She made it off of the Titanic alive and could tell her story. Not only was she telling it, she was getting paid a heck of a lot to do so. She had a successful movie running, she was the highest paid movie actress in the world, and she had the man she wanted getting ready to leave his wife any moment now so that he could marry her. Life was great. What was next? Retirement. After a film career that didn't even last two years, Dorothy retired at the top of her game. Some who have researched her extensively came to the conclusion that facing the fake Dorothy on the movie screen while knowing the truth about herself was just too much for her to handle, and that's why she walked away from the movie industry. But she still wanted fame. Her next move was to pursue a singing career. Jules was going to use his connections to make Dorothy an opera star. There was only one small problem with this. She couldn't really sing that well. But she did make it to the Metropolitan Opera House for one show run. There were no surprises there. Even Dorothy herself never said she had a pretty voice. She described her own voice as uncommon which leads me to believe that Dorothy got a lot of requests to sing solo. Solo that no one can hear, please ma'am. With her singing career over as soon as it started, Dorothy was ready to move on to the next phase of her life. She wanted a husband. No, not her own husband. She wanted Clara Brulatore's husband, Jules. Quick side note, because we are a caring audience, I know that you care as much about Dorothy's clothing items that she lost on the Titanic just as much as she did, so I want to let you know that eventually she was compensated for what she lost. She and her mother received a $4,000 check from White Star Line, the owner of Titanic, in January of 1913. Meanwhile, Jules was doing everything that he could do to please his little Dorothy. I should mention that he was roughly twice her age. She was 22 when she boarded the Titanic and Jules was 42 with an age-appropriate wife. But he was doing his best to get rid of that old hag and Dorothy was doing her best to be patient about it. Jules tried to make her wait as pleasant as he could. He gave Dorothy unlimited use of his Long Island house while she waited out his marriage. He also sent Dorothy and her mother on a few more European vacations, though how they mustered up their bravery to get on another ship is beyond me. And that little gray car that she just couldn't get her mind off of as the Titanic sank, Jules was letting her drive it all the time. It was already practically hers. So she spent a lot of days driving the Detroit to his Long Island home, where she could practice being his wife until it became her reality. Jules was actually doing double duty trying to satisfy both his mistress and his wife once he broke the news to Mrs. Brulatour. You can imagine that Clara was not too happy to hear from her husband of 18 years that he was ready to throw her out of the door and replace her with a younger woman. Not after she had loved and cared for him and had four children for him, only three were living. He understood that this news would not be easy for his wife to take, so he tried to make her happy too. Well, as happy as one could be given the circumstances. So he offered her a huge cash settlement to take and go live happily ever after, without him. $20,000 right away, and she would also be the beneficiary of his $65,000 life insurance policy. That $20,000 alone is equivalent to about $630,000 today. Would that be enough money for you to forget about your hurt and embarrassment from a cheating spouse? Let me know. I think that it would be a good start for me. But this offer came with a condition. Clara would have to give him a private separation 
because he didn't want the embarrassment of a public divorce and the scandal that it would cause. The nerve. Everything was about him and what he wanted. Clara didn't like it, but she wasn't a fool. Jules offered her enough money to keep herself and their kids comfortable for life, so she took him up on the offer. Even though she was angry and didn't care about his reputation being ruined in the press, she didn't want to be embarrassed either. And the thought of the world knowing that her husband had been cheating on her for over a year with this young, silly actress would have been too much shame for her to bear. So she went along with his plan. Everyone was getting what they wanted. Kind of. Jules and Dorothy would get exactly what they wanted. Clara would get the consolation prize of a comfortable living. Everything was going as planned until Dorothy messed it up. And I know that you're probably saying, why would she mess things up? This is what she wanted. Well, she didn't do it on purpose. Here's what happened. One night, a lovely couple, the Smiths, were out for a walk. Dorothy was on one of her many trips from her Manhattan apartment to her lover's Long Island house. Of course, she was driving her favorite car. Maybe she was daydreaming about her wedding, but something distracted her and she jumped a curb. Before she knew it, her favorite car was off of the street and on the sidewalk. She ran into that lovely couple. The woman was Julia Smith, and she sustained serious injuries that left her hospitalized for several weeks. Mr. Henry Smith died. Behind the wheel of her favorite car, Dorothy Gibson killed a man. So how did this cause a hiccup in the arrangements that Jules had made for both of his women? Well, of course, this car accident went very public, but not immediately. At first, Jules was able to keep everything pretty quiet, and it took me a long time to figure out just how. When I was looking for the news articles about this car accident, I couldn't find any at all. Then I accidentally stumbled upon the fact that Dorothy Gibson had been using the name Dora Gibson with everything connected to this fatal accident. She had even been on the stand in court as Dora Gibson. Okay, Dora. Julia Smith sued Dorothy for her husband's death and the injuries that she herself sustained. The amount that she was seeking varies depending on the source. It was somewhere between $4,500 and $25,000. When Dora testified, she told the court that she and Jules were good friends. She was asked how long she had the gray Detroit car. She said a little over a year. Then she was asked if she was friends with Mrs. Brulatour. She said that she was not. She didn't know her. Hmm. Good friends with him, but you don't know his wife of 18 years? That's suspicious. It was in this line of questioning that it was revealed that the car she was driving, the gray Detroit, wasn't even registered to Dorothy. Oops, I mean Dora. Well, whose car was this? The court and newspapers wanted to know. Oh, this car belongs to Jules Brulatour. I was just driving it. Really? Why? Are you driving the car as a business perk? No. Are you driving the car because you and Jules are such great friends? Um, sure. When Jules took the stand, he testified that Dora was, in fact, his fiance. That was why she was driving his car. This only makes me wonder about something that I don't know about. When was it required for adults to have identification cards on their persons all the time? Like, there is a very small chance that today you or I could get into a car accident, give a police officer the wrong name, and then show up to court under that same false name. Well, in 1913, Dorothy Gibson did it. And after Jules testified that he was going to marry her, that was a big enough scandal that this married man was going to marry some young woman named Dora. 
By the way, he mentioned all of that in some weird, horrible effort to help her get out of paying that woman for her husband's death, which I think is disgusting. But guess how the truth about Dorothy's identity came out? She told on herself. There's a Baltimore Sun article from May 1913 that has some details really wrong, like it states that Mr. Brulator's chauffeur was driving on the night of the wreck, but it has the quote from Dorothy that gave herself away. It starts with her own words, quote, You see, ever since the Titanic disaster, she continued glibly, I have been so nervous that I could not bear to drive the car at a high rate of speed or allow it to be driven fast. Thus, she disclosed her identity, end quote. During all of those court dates, no one knew a thing about her having been on the Titanic. She just let that slip out of her mouth. It was from that detail that everyone was able to figure it out. Jules made that Titanic movie and that girl in it was Dorothy Gibson. And all of the film industry people already knew about his relationship with her. He had no shame about carrying on with her publicly. And people basically just put two and two together. And there it was, the biggest movie star in the world killed a man with her car. It was more than just a sensational headline. It was a huge lawsuit and she did have to pay Mrs. Smith. Julia Smith was awarded the $4,500. Well, now, Clara Brulatour had been dragged into this and embarrassed. And with that, Jules no longer had the option to get that quiet, private divorce that he wanted. Remember, she only agreed to keep quiet because her own name wasn't going to be tarnished. But they were beyond that point because of his young, stupid, badly driving, murderous mistress. Now, Jules would have to suffer the shame of a very public divorce and still have to pay Clara a lot of money. I hope that she was worth it, Jules. Clara went on to sue Jules for divorce, and while he didn't get the privacy that he wanted about this matter, Jules finally got to marry the woman of his dreams, Dorothy Gibson, in 1917. She turned out to be a nightmare. They were both still the same people. And now, instead of cheating on their former spouses, they were cheating on each other. The marriage that they had both wanted so badly was over before it started. Dorothy and Jules learned that they both just liked the thrill of the adulterous nature of their affair. Without the excitement of potentially getting caught by their respective spouses, there was really nothing there. Very shortly after they exchanged vows, both Dorothy and Jules found other lovers. According to Jules, Dorothy had two lovers. Dirty Harlot, he was only cheating on her with one person. We know where this is going, so I won't waste your time. After about two years of their charade of a marriage, Dorothy filed for divorce and asked for $48,000 in alimony, $1.1 million in our money today, plus $30,000 for attorney's fees. Well, that was a drop in the bucket for Jules. He was literally a millionaire. He had way more money than that. But he didn't think that she was worth it. Dorothy remembered how Jules offered his first wife, Clara, over $80,000. Well, he didn't think that Dorothy was worth it. Why wasn't she worth a little bit less than that? Instead of agreeing to her demands or offering any money, Jules countersued her for divorce. He was telling the court, don't give her a divorce, give me a divorce. He actually wanted his marriage to be annulled on the ground that it was never legal in the first place. And he had a point. And for that reason, even Clara wanted a say in his divorce from Dorothy. This paragraph from a 1919 edition of the Buffalo Times sums it up pretty well. Quote, His plea for relief coincides with that of his first wife, from whom he obtained a decree of divorce by default in Kentucky in 1917. 
the first wife asks the marriage of the second wife to Brulatur to be annulled as a fraud upon her rights. She says she never was served with the divorce papers and had no knowledge of the divorce until he had married his second wife, end quote. And he did all of that just so he could be with this woman who he now wanted to get out of his life and out of his house. His house is actually. This divorce got so dirty. The woman who Jules had left his wife and children for, he was now calling a vampire and saying that she had put him under a spell and forced him to act against his will. That's the only reason that he cheated on his wife and left her. It was all Dorothy's fault. Well, here's how the judge resolved their matter. They got their divorce. Both parties were found to be equally responsible, and Jules was ordered to pay Dorothy $10,000 per year. But the judge was disgusted with both of them and said that neither party deserved any sympathy. He said that he only awarded Dorothy anything at all because he had to follow the law. The following year, Leonard Gibson... Dorothy's stepdad filed a suit against Jules as well for $50,000. I didn't look into the details of that one because by the time that I saw that, I already had enough material for this video to be over an hour long. During her marriage to Jules, Dorothy continued to conduct herself as the fame-hungry monster that he had helped to create. And Jules, once again, found himself tired of his wife and in search of a younger woman, and he found one. A new actress was on the rise. Her name was Hope Hampton, and she was eight years younger than the old hag, Dorothy Gibson. Oh, Dorothy, don't you know that when you are promoted from mistress to wife, you create a vacancy for a new mistress? That's just what Hope Hampton was, and Jules was in between Hope's legs before the ink was dry on the marriage certificate that he shared with Dorothy. I guess that Clara got the last laugh. Jules married Hope Hampton in 1923, and Dorothy was so embarrassed about it that she wanted to go and hide, and she literally did. Now, Dorothy got a taste of what it felt like for Clara Brulatour being replaced by her husband's younger mistress. But Dorothy only got a very small taste of it. She couldn't handle the heat, and she needed to get out of the kitchen, or the country. She was too embarrassed to stay in America after her husband had so publicly moved on. In her own words, quote, I had a great deal of unhappiness and much less money. Mr. Brulatour had married again, and we still had many of the same friends. I was not very happy as my husband and his new wife were always around. Therefore, I went to Paris to live with my mother. End quote. So Dorothy left New York and went to Paris with her mother in tow. The money that Jules was paying her was enough for her to live comfortably in Europe. And there, she partied her nights away, trying the best to forget the shame that was left upon her name back home. She was living it up drinking cocktails every day, hanging out with famous writers like James Joyce and H.G. Wells and her movie industry friends. And in Paris, she got the opportunity to be the woman on the side without any repercussions from the press. What can I say? She liked being with married men. She and her mom could let loose there. This was the life that they had always wanted. Pauline loved being in Paris so much that she didn't even go back to visit America for her husband's funeral. Eventually, Dorothy came to live a peaceful and quiet existence in France for some years, until trouble struck in 1939. The trouble was big. It was World War II. Pauline was half German, and she developed a strong loyalty to Germany while she and her daughter were living in Europe. She also developed an equal hate for America. She felt like the Germans had gotten a raw deal, bad press during World War I. They were just misunderstood. She didn't know exactly why people were so hard on them. But her loyalty to Germany was more than strong. Pauline was a Nazi sympathizer, 
and her influence on Dorothy was still ever so strong, and Dorothy became a bit of a Nazi sympathizer too. And these two gals, who always wanted to be on the winning team, thought and hoped that Hitler would win this war, so they sided with him. We all know how that worked out. In 1941, Dorothy's ego took another hit when the film Citizen Kane was released. Now I have to admit, I've never seen this movie. I'm not much of a movie person at all. But what I read about this movie is that there's a character who has a talentless wife named Susan. Susan was apparently based on Dorothy Gibson. The main character, Charles Kane, is a media mogul like Jules Brulatour. His wife, Susan, takes up opera singing, but she's no good at it, just like Dorothy had done. A gossip columnist named Luella Parsons wrote about the movie that, quote, it was Brulatour and his sad girls, end quote. Humiliating stuff for sure, but Dorothy had bigger fish to fry. She was in the middle of a war. And this is where things get really strange. For some reason, Dorothy's mother also developed a really strong liking for Mussolini, so she went to live in Italy to be as close to him as possible. Dorothy drove to get Pauline to bring her back to France and ended up getting stuck in Florence with her mother. There, she was interviewed by the Italian police and thrown in jail. She was charged with being an anti-fascist agitator. She didn't like jail at all. It wasn't nearly as luxurious as any place she'd called home in the past 20 years. So she left. She escaped. She tried to get to the Swiss border. Then she was captured and thrown into a Nazi concentration camp. While imprisoned, she met a double agent who was called Dr. Ugo. He came up with a plan to get himself, Dorothy, and another prisoner, who was a journalist, out of there. He had some help on the outside from Italian Catholic priests. The scheme that he cooked up was that they were all spies. Dorothy would just have to follow his lead and play along. Her last acting gig. It sounds like something from a corny movie, but believe it or not, his plan worked, and the three made it to Switzerland. But they weren't in the clear just yet. In Zurich, Dorothy was interrogated by authorities because they needed to know just what she knew and what kind of a threat she was. Thankfully for her, she was released because she was determined to be too stupid to be a real spy. One look at her spy work affidavit that she submitted to the American Consulate General and James Bell said that Dorothy, quote, hardly seems bright enough to be useful in such capacity, end quote. Sure, she may have been a bit moronic, but that saved her in the end. Authorities sent Dorothy's stupid ass with a one-way ticket back to Paris. There, she made her home in an apartment at the Hotel Ritz. She had a Spanish lover, Emilio Antonio Ramos, who was a press attaché for the Spanish embassy. She didn't get to enjoy a very long relationship with him, though, because she died. And that's all that I can say. On February 17, 1946, Dorothy Gibson Brulatour died in her apartment, and her death certificate did not list the official cause. By the time of her death, Dorothy was seen as such a joke that Hope Hampton, her husband's younger replacement model, was sometimes mentioned in her obituaries as the present Mrs. Brulatour. Ouch. I think that she deserved a moment to shine solo in her own death. Dorothy had some money and possessions to leave behind, and they were split between her lover and her mother, Pauline, who outlived Dorothy by 15 years. She died in her Paris hotel room, in 1961. Dorothy was one of Titanic's many first-class women to be rescued. Another one was Madeline Astor, the young wife of John Jacob Astor. Both ladies became second wives to men roughly twice their ages. But it was Madeline's love life with her third husband that was beyond chaotic and likely played a big role in her early death. 
I have published a video about their wild saga that you can see here. I'll leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are Press and Sun Bulletin Archives, 1912 The Buffalo News Archives, 1912 Shadow of the Titanic, The Extraordinary Stories of Those Who Survived by Andrew Wilson The Post Star Archives, 1912 The Buffalo Times Archives, 1912 and 1919 Buffalo Courier Archives, 1912 and 1913. The New York Times Archives, 1913. The Baltimore Sun Archives, 1913. The Pittsburgh Press Archives, 1919. The New York Tribune Archives, 1919 and 1920. And the Courier Archives, 1946. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ty's Too Hot Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, Hot Mess History. The link is in the description box.